Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. This episode is brought to you by Organifi. You know, the one thing that literally every single diet and nutrition expert that we've had on the show seems to agree on is that we need to eat more veg and get our greens and consume all natural products. But let's be honest, how many of us actually have the time? Well, recently I had the opportunity to meet some of the folks over at Organifi and I've been absolutely blown away by them and their product. You see, Organifi is an organic superfood green juice powder that literally covers all your nutritional bases without having to eat five bowls of kale. It saves you loads of time, loads of money, and a lot of chewing. And really all you have to do is add water and drink it. So to check it out and save an incredible 20% off your first order, visit Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. Dot com and use coupon code superhuman at checkout. This episode is brought to you by Become a Super Learner, the masterclass. You guys, if you have ever wanted to learn things faster, to read faster and waste less time reading boring textbooks, if you've ever wanted to have near perfect memory for names, numbers, anything you want to learn, and expand your mind and retain information in a way that you never thought possible, well, then the Become a Super Learner Masterclass is exactly what you've been looking for. It's a 10-week program developed by myself and my mentors alongside some of the world's best memory experts and world record-holding memory champions. It'll take you from zero to super learning hero in just a matter of 10 weeks in about 30 minutes a day or less. Now, you can go ahead and sign up for a free trial with no credit card required. All you have to do is go to jle.vi slash learn, and if you choose to pick up the full course, you will also get an incredible discount for listeners of this podcast only. So please make sure to check it out and support the show, and on to today's episode. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to this week's episode of the Becoming Superhuman podcast. Before we get started, I want to read you guys an incredible review from Ilse88, who actually won our 100th episode raffle. So thank you for the following review, Ilse. She says, great source of inspiration. I love this podcast. It always gives me a boost of inspiration to continue striving to reach my superhuman potential. It is a great source of motivation, research products, information, and a gateway for different-minded people of the same goal, reaching superhuman potential on all spectrums of life. This podcast, in addition to his courses and masterclass, have definitely made an impact. Wow. Thank you so much, Ilse. I really, really appreciate that. And by now, I know I'm a little bit late in recording, but by now you probably got that human charger in the mail. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. On to today's episode, you guys. I know this is really, really confusing, but today we are joined by John Levy, except we're joined by my doppelganger, John Levy, who spells it with a Y instead of an I. He's the author of The 2 AM Principle, Discover the Science of Adventure. Now, John was once a self-described nerd, as myself. But today, he runs with the bulls in Pamplona. He crashes million-dollar weddings. He takes a flight on average every three days, and he's widely considered to be one of the top experts in adventure. And he has endorsements from some of the industry's biggest names like Lewis Howes and my good friend Chris Bailey, who introduced us. Now, in this episode, we talk about John's framework He has a framework, you guys, for seeking out and experiencing jaw-dropping adventures. Now, as someone who considers adventure to be one of the eight criteria for a balanced and happy life and an avid adventurer myself, I was eager, absolutely eager to figure out how John finds and chooses various adventure opportunities and how he's turned something so seemingly random into a well-thought-out methodology. We talk about all the crazy similarities that he and I have. We talk about his epic framework. 
We talk about different ways to ensure that you're going to have adventures, and we get a little bit more clarity on what it actually means to have an adventure and why you might want to have more of them. So it's a fantastic episode. I think you guys are really going to get a lot out of it. And so without any further ado, I'm very excited to introduce you all to my doppelganger, Mr. John Levy. John Levy, Booker Tov, welcome, my friend. How are you? I'm great. I'm so excited to actually be interviewed and talking to my doppelganger. It's so weird. and It's a rare treat. I didn't realize you were from, like, I live very close to where your family's home is in Kenema Temanim in Tel Aviv, which is crazy, like probably like 500 meters away. That's incredible. So cool. So, John, tell us your backstory. According to your bio, you used to be a nerd. I used to be a, you know, a little half Israeli nerd myself. So, tell us what that was like and what happened to uh change it. First, let's start off with I'm still a big nerd. Totally <laughs> it's me too. Just I've managed to kind of use it to my advantage. <laughs> So now I have a beard, so I look like every hipster from Brooklyn that exists. There you go. Here's the basic background. Uh, when I was growing up, there were no cool nerds, right? There were no dot-com billionaires. There were no technology-obsessed cultures that cared about iPhones and latest laptops and all that. People who are into that and sci-fi were relegated to the sidelines of society. Mm. And so eighth grade, my teacher walks in and she announces that we're uh, redoing the seating chart in the class. And she had this like fun idea. She said, each person gets to submit two people they want to sit with and two that they just don't want to be near. And each of us got to secretly submit it. And through an unfortunate series of events, I found out two things. The first was that there's this one kid that nobody wanted to sit with. And the second was that I was that kid. Oh, my gosh. That's the worst. Why would a teacher do that? She had no idea. I don't blame her. I understand the entire idea. It was very clever. Oh, my God. Did you smell or what was the deal? You know, I was geeky. I was kind of chubby. I just didn't fit in. And, you know, like I said, geekiness wasn't supported back then. Right. I feel that. I got really interested in what causes people to make the decisions that they make and what affects them. And so eventually I became a human behavior scientist and I work uh, with a brilliant neuroscientist by the name of Moran Cerf out of his lab. And uh, I get to do research and then I'll do research on anything from what causes us to pick matches in online dating to the way that we, what affects our consumer purchasing behavior. And uh, kind of the areas that I'm most known for is understanding influencers, the people who have an ability to shape a industry. And The Science of Adventure. And I just wrote a book about that. Interesting. And that's your first book, correct? Yes, it is my first and hopefully of many, assuming books still exist in the future. Amazing. Okay, because I was going to say, I I knew you did a little bit of stuff on influencers. Most of the questions that I've got for you are around adventure. So I do want to get in a little bit to the influence stuff and we'll come back and we'll touch on that. And there's plenty of time. I'm happy to come back. Awesome. But each of the topics are kind of huge in their own right. So I want to make sure that your listeners get everything that they're totally for. So let's start out with adventure. First, I think what everyone wants to know, if you wrote a book on adventure, tell me about some of your top adventures. What's some of the coolest shit you've done? Okay. So some of the craziest stuff that's happened to me is I got crushed by a bull in Pamplona and almost died uh, during running of the bulls. I've uh, swam in Antarctic waters and (laughs) was completely non-functional when I left the water. I didn't feel my legs or arms. It felt like tree trunks were just moving. I almost fell off the ghost tower of Bangkok. What else? I just came back from three and a half weeks in Southeast Asia. So uh, when I was in the back, kind of like woods areas of Lake Inland, Myanmar, me and my travel companion got totally lost on a bike ride. It was pitch black. There was oncoming traffic, but the streets there weren't, there were no lights. And so they swerved out of the way. I fell on the road and totally busted up my body, completely bruised and bleeding. We're lost, super concerned. And uh, we find this shack where 11 people live in one room and they let us in and they offer us their homemade whiskey. I mean, this stuff could make you go blind. And uh, over the course of the next hour, we become friends and taken in by the family. And they teach me in like this really weird gambling game that's like part shuffle puck, part pool, part cards. 
And we eventually find a boat that will take us back to our hotel. But it was kind of, you know, pretty concerning at certain parts because there was traffic coming towards us. And I was just in a bathing suit with no money. And uh, it was a bit of craziness. But that kind of stuff happens to me pretty often. I once even within 10 seconds of meeting the woman behind the duty free counter at Stockholm Orlando Airport, she agreed to leave her job and travel with me around Israel with my family. You're kidding me. No. That's really intense. Yeah. To this day, she's one of our family's closest friends. No way. That's just awesome. I love that. I'm really big on intimacy and just like, how can you become really, really familiar with someone really, really fast? I think it's such a fascinating topic as well. So I go into that kind of in depth in the book, which is I really looked at, I was curious how quickly I could build trust with people. Mm -hmm. And one of the experiments I ran, so essentially the book, just to give the listeners some background, people would always tell me that adventures happen by chance, but that didn't make any sense to me because if they did, all of us would live similarly exciting lives and we don't. So there has to be something that certain people embody that if we could kind of quantify it or make sense of it, all of us could learn from it. And so I believe that there are four stages to every adventure and each stage has specific characteristics that when you apply them, make life exciting. And so I collected research by people who are far smarter than me. And each chapter is a combination of a crazy story with scientific research that I was able to find and then how I applied it. So in the case of trying to build connections with people quickly, I dropped myself off in Nice, France. I don't speak French. I don't know the city. I've never been there. The last train had left. I had no place to sleep. And I was either going to convince a stranger to put me up for the night or I was going to sleep on the street. And that's where I started. (laughs) And I kind of break down techniques and research and ideas so that people can really apply it to their life. Because there's so much research out there that has a huge potential to impact us. But most of it is just referred to in a novel way, like, oh, you know, a did you know kind of thing that you see in a men's magazine. But if we can actually begin to apply it, we can have huge impacts on people's lives. And that's the hope of the book. Wow. So these four stages, is this the epic model that you talk about, EPIC? Yeah, absolutely. So I believe that there, the four stages are, the first is establish. You have to put the right elements in place so that anything can happen. Not that it will, but you want to put the odds in your favor. And the most important of those is to have the right group of people because the right team will either make a terrible event amazing or you could go to the best party in the world. But if you have the wrong people with you, it'll be miserable. Right. And so I kind of go into the science of team selection and what an impact people have on our lives. And it, it's actually startling. So if you look at research by Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler, they were curious about the obesity epidemic. Is it something that passes from person to person like a cold or is it a percentage of the population? You know, something that just erupts. Mm -hmm. And what they found was startling. So, Jonathan, if you were obese, me just knowing you increases my chances of obesity by 45%. Yep. My friends who don't know you, their chances increase by 25%. Their friends by 10% and their friends by 5%. Yep. And so we have an impact four degrees out on the quality of the lives in our communities. Mm -hmm. And so I really am committed to figuring out how to curate the best people to bring them together so that they impact each other positively. You and me both. And I'm curious how you do that because I do the same thing. I always like to say, you know, your vibe sets your tribe or you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I do it by curating dinner parties, by very actively curating connections. I have lists in my contacts of people that I aspire to spend more time with. How do you go about curating? Because I know people can be uncomfortable with that term. You know, I curate the people that I build community with or that I spend time with. First of all, I commend you for that. I think that it's an incredibly valuable skill. And I think that it's the curators that will define the future, right? It's Mm -hmm. the people who understand how to build community. So the first thing is, and... I didn't mention this at the beginning. I'm the founder of what's called The Influencers. It's a private community comprised of hundreds. I think we're over 900 members now. It started off as a secret dining experience. 12 people were invited at a time. None of them know each other, and they're not allowed to talk about what they do or give their last name. They cook dinner together. And when they sit down to eat, 
everybody gets to guess what everybody does. And they find out that it's a famous author sitting across from a Nobel laureate, the editor in chief of a magazine sitting across from the president of a television network. And so I've hosted over 100 dinners across eight cities in two countries. And uh, this community is just an extraordinary group of people. That's awesome. I look for ways to bring people together in unique experiences that will cause them to bond. That will cause really deep connections. Well, thank you. I love it. And, and there's so much power. I've talked about this in the past with some of my co-authors and people that I work with. That There's so much power in being that connector and creating that value. I mean, because ultimately people will remember you by the impact you leave on their life. And if that impact is... I mean, I still remember the person who connected me to the Burning Man community or the Summit community or who first got me involved with TEDx here in Israel. You remember these mm. things. You remember these people who brought this incredible value into your life. And you remember them very favorably. Yeah. And, and what's nice is that they get to enjoy the halo effect of it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's impossible to maintain relationships very deeply with thousands of people. Mm -hmm. But if you know how to bring people together, then it, I think it accelerates the bonding process. Absolutely. So you feel a lot closer than you otherwise would. But just to bring us back to mm -hmm. the epic model, one of the other things that you really want to take care of when you establish is selecting a location, preferably one that you haven't been to before. The reason is that your brain responds differently in new environments. It entices you to explore and understand, and that opens you up to new experiences. Then the second stage is push boundaries. As I define an adventure, it's only an adventure if you've grown from it. The person at the end has to be distinct from the person that started. So you have to cross some kind of social, physical, or emotional boundary. And so I set that up as the second stage to ensure that people realize that that needs to take place no matter what. Mm -hmm. The third stage is increase. You want to maximize your enjoyment, right? Why leave until you've gotten everything you can from wherever you are? <laughs> And to do that, you can use challenges. There's a series of characteristics you can entertain. You can use surprises and so on. And the book goes into detail on all of these and the science behind them. And then the final stage is continue. In continue, you look at specific characteristics to see where you should go next and how you get there. Because it's not always an option to walk if people are wearing heels or if it's cold out or raining or whatever it is. And if you do choose to continue, you loop back through. If you don't, the key is to end with style. And the reason that's so important is that this very famous Nobel laureate from Israel by the name of Dan Kahneman, mm -hmm. probably one of the most brilliant minds of the past hundred years. And Kahneman and Tversky did an experiment. In the experiment, the researchers had participants put their hands in a bucket of cold water. I believe it was 14 degrees centigrade. And they did it for 60 seconds and had to evaluate how uncomfortable they were. Then in the second experiment, the people pulled their hand out, let them warm up, and they put their hands in the same water, 14 degrees centigrade, for 60 seconds, plus an additional 30 seconds as it was slowly increased to 15 degrees. Mind you, total length of time greater, total discomfort greater. For the third experiment, the researchers asked the participants which one they would like to repeat, the first experiment for 60 seconds or the second experiment for 90 seconds. And surprisingly, overwhelmingly, people selected 90 seconds. Hmm. And the reason is, even though it's more uncomfortable, people don't remember the duration of pleasure or pain. What they remember are the peaks of experiences and how they end. Mm -hmm. So if you can end on a really positive note, you'll remember the entire experience more positively. Love Where it. a lot of people slip up is that they try to push experiences past the point of enjoyment. And then it deteriorates and we remember it less fondly. You end up at like a pizza place at four o'clock in the morning, exhausting yourself and waking up the next morning, wondering why you were out so late and losing the entire day from it. Mm. So the reason that the book is called the 2 a.m. principle is that nothing good happens after 2 a.m. except the most epic experiences of your life. Epic being establish, push boundaries, increase, continue. So the key is, Whatever you do, end on a positive note, even if it means ending slightly earlier. I mean, you can take the risk and push things, but chances are nothing good happens after 2 a.m. Totally. And if they do, make them extraordinary. I really love that because I'm very often the first one to leave events. And it's exactly mm -hmm. that. It's like, I think I sense the moment of diminishing marginal returns where I'm like, well, mm -hmm. this isn't getting better. This DJ is not getting any better, you know. 
I'm not drinking. So, you know, it's basically like, well, this is about as good as it's going to get. I think I'm, I think I'm set. And so apparently the research yeah. indicates that that would lead to the kind of most satisfaction. Well, here's the interesting thing. There's also a very clear difference in people's tolerance and desire for novelty and experience. And you just got to be honest with yourself. If you're like an introvert, the type of adventures you'd be interested in are probably not the things that I'm doing. Right. But the lessons still apply regardless of who you are. So just because you're not going to invite the lovely woman behind the duty-free counter to travel with your family (laughs) doesn't mean that the theories that are behind it wouldn't have an incredibly positive impact on your life. Amazing. And that's what's important to me. You know, the photo for this blog post is going to have to be you with this Swedish woman, right? It's going to have to be. (laughs) Out of respect, I've left photos of her off the internet. Oh, yeah, of course. I'm just kidding. Although we were in the back of New York City cabs. There's a photo of us that was in the back of every New York City cab for a week. That's so funny. So how do you define adventure then? Because as you said, adventure differs for everybody, right? So for me, adventure is kind of anytime I'm outside of my comfort zone. But what does it mean to you? Well, I went around trying to figure that out and I, you know, looked up definitions and dictionaries and Wikipedia and anything I could find. And there wasn't anything that was satisfactory to me (laughs) because they gave these partial explanations that seemed to work in some cases, but not all. And so I had to come up with my own definition. So an adventure as I see it is an experience that is one, exciting and remarkable. Now, it has to be remarkable because as a society or as a species, we've passed down our knowledge through an oral history. And so if it's not worth remarking about, it's not culturally significant. Hmm. Now, what's remarkable for you is going to be different than what's remarkable for me. So you get to be you. Two, possesses adversity and or risk. And here's the important part, preferably perceived risk. Although your brain processes imminent danger differently than a perceived risk, the physical response is almost identical. And so you can get the benefit of having that exhilaration and fear even without ever putting yourself in any direct danger. So skydiving, for example, is incredibly safe. Mm -hmm. Free diving, incredibly safe when you follow the rules. But you can have that experience of being outside of your comfort zone without ever being in any peril. And three, brings about growth. The person you are at the end is distinct from the person that started. If you look at any great story, any great hero or heroine's journey, they always are left changed from the experience. Right. And if you aren't a unique human being at the end from who you started, then it was a great experience. It may have been remarkable even, right? Bumping into your favorite celebrity might be a remarkable experience. It doesn't mean it was an adventure Mm -hmm. because you didn't have to grow from it. Wow. I really like that definition. That's fantastic, especially given what I do and my kind of commitment to personal growth. I mean, that's I've made a career out of it. So I really like that you need to have moved the needle as an individual in order for it to have been really an adventure. Yeah, I'm a big fan because essentially the book, a lot of it spends time just focusing on or is part of the conversation that the size of your life is in direct proportion to how uncomfortable you're willing to be. Mm-hmm. And so the the big joke is that I wish people really uncomfortable lives. That's awesome. I really love that. I really, really love that because I'm always trying to push people a little bit out of their comfort zone, you know, with acro yoga and well, wait, but I can't be upside down and, you know, with all kinds of different activities. Let me ask you this. And I think it's really interesting. Not only, you know, that one of your activities is you host a salon and, and a dinner party, which I literally do exactly the same, a salon dinner party, but also that, you know, you focused on specifically choosing adventures and kind of like being, as you said, the first letter in the acronym is about setting up the right people, the right places. So I used to take Tuesdays off just for adventure, right? But trying to sit down and actually source these adventures, find the right people to do them with, plan them, you know, after a week of surfing, a week of epic road trip, a week of this, I kind of ran out of ideas. So How do you go Mm -hmm. about choosing adventures, not to mention, you know, the people you choose, but how do you actually source new and exciting stuff week after week or month after month to do? So there's a few things. One is in the established phase, I didn't speak about these two characteristics. I also recommend that people have an underlying mission. 
because when you're in the same environment, it's hard to keep it fresh, Mm -hmm. right? It's easy to fall into the same patterns. So in order to do that, uh, you create missions and you also add constraints. So for example, if you were to go out for drinks with your friends, that might be fun. That wouldn't be an adventure. If you were to go out with drinks for your friends and you decided to go to the top four cocktail bars in the city and have their best cocktail at each, that's an interesting experience. If you weren't allowed to pay for any of your own drinks, (laughs) now that would be an adventure. Because now the way that you engage with your environment is completely different. You can go the same four bars you always go to, or even the same bar. But all of a sudden, because of the constraints, it becomes new again and exciting. (laughs) Love it. As you're going out, you may need to increase the constraints continuously. And the reason is that human beings tend to be the most engaged when they're doing something slightly outside their comfort zone. If you look at research by Mihai Csikszent Mihai, Mm -hmm. uh, he researched flow state and peak human performance. You enter flow when you are doing something that is requires skill. It is outside of your current skill set, but not so far outside that you're constantly failing. And so by setting up missions and creating constraints, you can create a confluence of activity that is just outside of your comfort zone. That's really engaging that you spend part of it failing, but you get to grow from it. And the key is it doesn't really matter if you fulfill on your mission. I mean, one of the chapters in the book, me and my friend, this guy and this girl uh, all went out and we decided we were going to convince a stranger to give us their underwear. Now we failed miserably. I almost got beat up. Like it just went terrible over and over again, (laughs) but it caused us to have conversations that we would never have otherwise. And we made friends and uh, the girl who was in the group ended up getting a guy's number. And I think that they even went out like all these things that just wouldn't normally happened have happened, happened. And that's because it served as a catalyst for interaction. Mm. So part of the answer is create constraints and missions. Have something that you can strive towards. So the other thing is, I think that it's easy to define an adventure as something that's very physical, right? Like surfing, rock climbing, all that. But there are also very social adventures. You could create a mission of performing four acts of kindness for random strangers, but you can only spend $3. <laughs> so now you have to be really creative. I once did that on a date and we went into like a pharmacy and picked up all this random stuff. And I think we like we made cards for somebody like who was homeless and all that. And so it got us out of our comfort zone and forced us to be creative in the way that we engaged the environment. And so I think the key is not to look at it in such a strict fashion, right? Your adventure could literally be I'm going to walk from one side of a city to another. And during that time, I have to make five friends. Mm -hmm. I really like it. And that'll force you to engage with people and figure out how to talk to them and get you outside of your comfort zone. I once had a day with my (laughs) with my friend Liam, uh, my best friend in the books, several. uh, We walked Broadway and saw how many things we could get for free. And uh, we went into Ben and Jerry's and tried all 30 flavors. It was absolutely disgusting by, you know, flavor 10 or whatever. But we just kept going because we got to rack up the points. Amazing. Amazing. I really like the creativity element of it. It sounds like that's like a huge component and kind of goes hand in hand with, as you said, like Chicksimahai and needing to be outside of your comfort zone just enough. Mm -hmm. And I think the key here is that not everybody is super creative. So pair off with somebody who is, mm-hmm. but there's no shame in that. Like I, there's so many skill sets I just don't have. Like I, I don't like driving particularly. So I pair off with someone who does like nobody expects you to have all of the skill sets. Your skill set could literally be bringing people together. And then with their combined skills, you guys can do great stuff together. Totally. Totally. Okay. So where do people get started? I mean, we really love to assign homework on the show. So, you know, where can people start having their first adventure? What should they start considering right away? Well, the shameless plug would be pick up the 2 a.m. principle. Totally. And then I'm totally going to pick it up. (laughs) And then after that, I think it's to ask yourself what is exciting and inspires you. Mm -hmm. Right. So every year I take on a travel project 
or personal growth project. And it has to be something that's outside of my comfort zone. One year I decided I was going to travel to every major event in the world once a month. So whatever that month's event was. And so I was at Burning Man. I was at Running of the Bulls. I was at Cannes Film Festival, Toronto International Film Festival, so on. And I had no idea I was going to pay for it. So by setting a lofty goal that inspires me and excites me, I think that that's a huge benefit. The other thing is I treat it like a project rather than a resolution, right? If you screw up on a resolution, like you don't go to the gym one day, you feel like a jerk. But projects have setbacks. Mm -hmm. And so I try to find something that's large enough that it'll inspire me and push me and not so rigid that if I fail once, I'm done. Mm. So this year's, the goal is to become superhuman. Love it. And well, you're on the right podcast. <laughs> that's what I was so excited about. So I've already done a free diving course. I can hold my breath for over two and a half minutes and can dive to 14 meters underwater. That's level one certification. Incredible. I'm considering doing level two and three, which would take me down to 35 meters. I learned transcendental meditation to get focus and control. Right. I'm looking at Wim Hof. I was just going to recommend it. I would actually love your recommendations on this. I'm thinking of going to live for a few weeks with Razel, who's the beatbox champion of the world. Yeah, the godfather of noise. Uh huh. Well, he's, he's my godfather. Oh, that's and awesome. And so I was going to go live with him out in Connecticut to learn, you know, how to do the course and the beat at the same time. Let's do some memory stuff for you. We can do some memory and mnemonics so we can get you memorizing, you know, like 500 names or numbers in a row. Yeah. So I'm, that's one of the other things I was super uh, curious about. Is there like a school for it? I'd love to just like... I own the school for it, man. <laughs> do you really? Yeah. That's, uh, I had no idea. That's how I finance this whole operation is, uh, yeah, we teach online courses. Here we go. Plug for our stuff. We teach online courses at becomeasuperlearner.com where we teach people speed reading. But more than anything, we teach people memory techniques and accelerated learning techniques. So we'll have to I'm send in. you over a link to that. I remember when I read Moonwalking with Einstein. Exactly. And I was so impressed by how the Europeans just demolished the Americans in mm -hmm. terms of memory skills and how underdeveloped we are. So check this. In the masterclass, one of the kind of exclusive things we have is an interview with the four-time USA memory champion, uh, Nelson Dellis, where he talks about, because actually... Last year, for the first time ever, an American won. And it's like, well, how did they bridge that huge gap from the early 2000s to now? And he explains exactly the method that they used to beat the Europeans, the Chinese. Pretty incredible. That's pretty super incredible because cool. it was, you know, a team event and stuff like that. So I'm so not familiar with this. I know there are people like you who are like literally experts on understanding how people shatter the limits of human experience. Yeah, to be honest, I'm not so up to date on the competitive memory sport either. Like, I don't really follow the championships unless Nelson uh, wins, in which case, you know, he's my buddy. So, but besides yeah, that, yeah, it's kind that's of super cool. Yeah. So, this is my adventure for the year. What other skills are there? Like, people have suggested everything from, you know, uh, biofeedback to tantric to like Wim Hof to memory. How about this? If you had a child, what would be mm. your superhuman skills that you'd make sure that they learned early on? Yeah. So first and foremost would be the memory. I would break it down to physical, mental, and emotional. Basically, that's kind of how I look at human beings as in this kind of triangle matrix. So, you know, the memory, mental stuff like that, we just talked about the emotional stuff. I think you probably know a lot about it's kind of like learning how to build intimacy, learning to be trustworthy, like you know, it's reading and digesting Dale Carnegie 13 times and then being able to elicit the emotional states in other people, trust, mm -hmm. etc. that you want. And also having the emotional clarity to kind of control your own emotions, which I think you probably get a lot of from the meditation. And then on top of that, it's the physical, right? So can you squat at least one and a half times your body weight? Can you ideally deadlift twice your body weight? so on and so forth. Can you bench press one and a half times your body weight? So having that physical strength, especially if it includes some element of metabolic training, that would be my three criteria. And then, you know, like nailing down all the stuff that supports all those things. So sleep, diet, mm -hmm. etc. But those are all means to the ends of physical strength, emotional strength, and mental strength. Huh. Have you ever looked at parkour? I have. 
I need to get into it, but I'm like super risk averse because all my teeth have already been replaced once. <laughs> so are you serious? Yeah. You're animal. Yeah. Well, not all, but like all my four front teeth are all fake. I was a really rambunctious kid. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Uh, so I guess, is there anything else I could provide the listeners? Everything from wild stories to... Yeah, well, so I guess I'd like to ask you some rapid fire questions in our last kind of five minutes. I know it's it's now getting to 2 a.m. and I imagine that this isn't the most epic experience of your life. So you probably want to go to bed. Uh, you know, no, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually super... I just got in from Myanmar. So my hours, for me, it's like three in the afternoon right now or something like that. So my hours are totally messed up. Okay, cool. So let me hit you with a few kind of rapid fire questions. First and foremost, what are a few books that have changed your life? So from a young age, uh, The Little Prince. Oh. And uh, The Adventures of Peter Pan. Good one. Because ones. these have a spirit of wonder and adventure that are second to none. The way that The Little Prince sees the world is truly inspiring. Mm. And when you look at the story of Peter Pan, they have this thing called the Neverland, which kind of got turned around, but it's like the space where anything can happen. Mm -hmm. And he had this group called the Lost Boys, which just were essentially dedicated to the state of childlike wonder and adventure. And so if you look on any of my social stuff, it's John Levy, J-O-N-L-E-V-Y, T-L-B, the Lost Boy. Love it. Uh, because so inspired by those characters. In my adult life, I would say the writings of Shaldini influence mm -hmm. and persuasion. I love Adam Grant's books. I think he's a brilliant researcher. Uh, Dan Ariely, mm -hmm. who wrote Predictably Irrational, The Upside of Irrational, essentially all the behavioral economists. Right. They're doing amazing work to show how irrational we are. And their research has a huge potential to impact the quality of our lives and create programs that really help us fulfill the things that we care about. Absolutely. And I'm really glad you mentioned, by the way, Peter Pan, because I often, you know, true to our doppelganger relationship, I often use the term Peter Pan as a verb. Like when people mm. will come and visit and they'll be like, oh, I don't want to fly home tomorrow. I'll just come Peter Pan with me in Tel Aviv, man. <laughs> Never <laughs> grow up and anything's possible. Awesome. I love it. So, all right. Next rapid fire question. What products or services could you not do your job without? I imagine something like Skyscanner is really useful for you, but what are the things allow you to, you know, resources, products, websites, travel bags, like stuff that you can recommend that makes your adventuring possible? Okay, so there are a handful of products that a lot of people don't know about. One is the Tumi Travel Adapter. It's smaller than like a small card holder, and it allows you to use a US plug in something like 112 countries. Wow. So it does British, South African, like anything you could imagine, European, Southeast Asia, like you could use any outlet and it's about the size of like a thick card holder. Uh, and then it has an adapter and it also has its own search protector built in. So if things go awry, wow. you'll be safe. With the adapter, you can have up to two electrical plugs in and then three USB items charging. Impressive. That's a solid first one. <laughs> Second is I like to smell, be positively odorous <laughs> when I travel. And so there's these small adapters or containers for cologne or perfume. And essentially, you take the top off of your perfume or cologne bottle and you pump into it and it it fits the legal requirements for travel. So I travel with like two or three different colognes with me and because I'm often on the road for like a month at a time. Solid. And that is a a huge, when I'm traveling and I'm doing a lot of nightlife stuff, I carry a travel for breeze because if it smells clean, it's clean by travel standards. Totally. So that's on that side. Then on the tech side, I've been uh, playing around with a lot of stuff. So first of all, physical products, a flask. I like to carry around a flask because if I'm out late adventuring, socializing, and it's after last call, I still have something I can share with people. And it's a very intimate experience sharing something from a flask. Mm -hmm. So it builds our relationships fast. From a tech side, there's a little hack with Google Maps where you type in OK Maps and it'll download the map for whatever you're focused around. Cool. So that way, if you're not by an internet connection, so I was just in Myanmar, I actually couldn't do it there, I think, because of it's a dictatorship. But, <laughs> but in general... You can download full maps 
and uh, be able to get around without an internet connection. Wow. Which is phenomenal. I also have a pretty sizable team of VAs that work for me, about five of them. Okay. And I have a standard operating procedure in place that when I travel, they automatically look at my calendar, see which cities I'm traveling to, and then produce a custom guide for that city based on my preferences. Wow. We're like the so, same person. Um, it's so weird. Like I literally spend my whole day designing SOPs for our staff members who are in the Philippines. How funny. I have a staff member in the Philippines too. This is a weird uh, like Twilight Zone type thing. <laughs> that's awesome. So then there's that. And there's also with Google Translate, you can download dictionaries for it. Mm -hmm. So you can have uh, speech recognition, I think, functional on a language while you're on an airplane. <laughs> oh, so cool. I, then we were once like stuck on a flight and there was this guy from Brazil who didn't understand what was going on. And so I was able to like translate from Portuguese to uh, French or something like that. It was just like totally random, but they were able to have a conversation as a byproduct. Interesting. And you can just download these. Yeah. randomly in Google Translate. Yes. Now, wow. here's another one that's kind of crazy, is that there's actually a way to fake your location on your phone. Mm -hmm. It's GPS. You can just find instructions online. It's super easy. You go into developer mode. And what you can do is you can, what I often recommend for people to try is, if you're going into a city where you don't know anybody, then fake your GPS location and open a dating app and start swiping. Totally. And you can be in a relationship, just say it, that you're there for friendship and it's fine. I think the statistics are something like one out of 10 people on a dating app is just looking for friendship anyway. Mm -hmm. And then you can uh, get people's advice or connect with them or go hang out with them. And uh, I'll sometimes even just message people who seem really cool on Instagram so I can find interesting people in different areas. Totally. So there's kind of, I guess the question is, what are you looking to accomplish? And so I can get by with very little just because I've developed those skill sets over a long time. Mm -hmm. right? When I was, I can get by without a phone, I can get by without money, I can be, because I've learned to connect with people. But uh, there's definitely stuff that makes our lives a lot easier. <laughs> Amazing. So I know we're running long here. I wanted to ask you, I think we should do definitely another episode on influencers. I definitely want to hear about how you're working with your VAs because I'm always looking for creative ways to leverage, you know, the smart people in our organization. So I think we should both commit to doing another episode in the near future if you'd be open for that. Gladly. I also think that you should have Demir Jokai and his wife on. Okay. Carrie, they live in Bali because they've developed an entire outsourced VA system and training course for people to kind of for productivity. Oh, that's and awesome. So they probably have a lot, but they're like really legitimately living the life, like digital nomads that are really digital nomads. That's awesome. You know, actually, I'll look him up. The other person I'd recommend is Ari Mizell and his oh, yeah. We've partner, had Nick Sonberg. He's great. They're great guys. So and cool. their company leverage is just brilliant. So cool. So before we uh, close up here, John, I want to ask you, where can people learn more and get in touch with you? Obviously, we will link to the book in the blog post, but what are the links should we provide people with? Uh, so my website is John Levy, T-L-B, J-N-L-E-Y, like yellow, mm -hmm. T like Thomas, I like lion, B like boy, uh, and dot com. And I'm the same thing on Instagram, Twitter. You can see my adventures. You can even see the photo of the guys in the hut who took us in and the game that they taught me because I posted photos of it on there. I'm also that on Facebook. So I'm super easy to find. If anybody has a major question, I try to get to people's emails and it's actually me answering. So if I have the time, I'll, I'll definitely make it. And yeah, I look forward to hearing from people. Awesome. And hopefully I'm picking up the book. So John, last question we always close with, which is if people take away just one message and they carry it with them for the rest of their lives, what would you hope for that to be? The size of our lives are in direct proportion to how uncomfortable we're willing to be. So I hope that all of you have incredibly uncomfortable lives and the blessings that come with that. Perfect. Phenomenal note to end on. John, I really, really appreciate it. Thanks so much for staying up late and sharing your wisdom with us. I look forward to our next call. 
This has been an absolute pleasure, Doppelganger. All right, brother. Thanks for having me on. Take care. You too. All right, super friends, that's it for this week's episode. We hope you really, really enjoyed it and learn a ton of applicable stuff that can help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If so, please do us a favor and leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or however you found this podcast. In addition to that, we are always looking for great guest posts on the blog or awesome guests right here on the podcast. So if you know somebody or you are somebody or you have thought of somebody who would be a great fit for the show or for our blog, please reach out to us either on Twitter or by email. Our email is info at becomingasuperhuman.com. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies, or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.